goes down, now I can't see it. And so I have to take radio communication. And there's a man that's on the top watching me. He says, okay, Jimmy, you're coming down through the shaft. He watches at the top. And then when it comes to that spot where it gets real tight again, there's another man standing there and he's watching me. And the bucket's coming down and I try to go down um, three, four hundred feet a minute, go down as fast as I can until he picks me up. And he'd say, okay, Jimmy, a hundred feet, start slowing down. Fifty feet, start slowing down. Twenty-five, and I, when it gets to zero feet, it's in his hands. And now they're going to put it through the doorways of the Galloway. And as it was coming through the Galloway, as I've been thinking about all the uncertainty in my own life, and the thing that causes me trouble of soul. God used the signal man to talk to my spirit. And this is what he said. He said, okay, Jimmy. They call me Jimmy. He says, okay, Jimmy, I got my eyes on you. Meaning the bucket's coming down right through the spot. He says, okay, you're coming through the first door. I got my eyes on you. Coming through the second door got my eyes on you. And when he said it was coming through the third door, which when it was going to open up to the bigger part of the tunnel, he said, I got you, Jimmy, coming on through. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And he said, you can have blessed assurance because, Jimmy, no matter what doors of life you have to pass through, I got you. On you. Amen. My name, God spoke to me through that man, like God was saying, Jimmy, from heaven, you can't see me. Just like you can't see me below that shaft. You don't know what's coming next. You don't know the future. But I got my eyes on you more than I got my eyes on you. I got you, Gigi, yeah. says the Lord. I got you, Mary, says the Lord. When you're going through the doors of uncertainty, there is a blessed assurance that Jesus has got you. Amen. Amen. Let's sing that song, Blessed Assurance. And while you sing it, I want you to have the assurance in your heart that Jesus is with you. His Spirit is giving you a foretaste of heaven. Heaven on earth to know Jesus, no matter what you're going through. Amen? Thank you, Pastor, for letting me share a little bit before we sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is
You have come, Jesus, to save us from depression and anxiety and loneliness and grief that comes to swallow us. You are our Savior. Can you praise Him? Thank you, Lord. Praise Him right now. He is our Savior. Yes. He's come to liberate us and give us blessed assurance that we are lost in His love this morning. Glory to God. All is at rest. Amen. Hallelujah. Our soul is in delight. Our soul is at rest. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes. Amen.
Listen to what it says. Oh, my sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Even the sins that I've committed against the Lord since I've known Him as my Savior has been nailed to the cross. And I bear them no more. Can you let go this morning? Yes. Let go. Amen. Let go of all of those things that produce guilt and shame and remorse in your heart for yesterday. Just let it go and say it has been nailed to the cross. It's been nailed. Thank you, Lord. And I bear it no more. And to, and, um, to pick it up again would be a crime against God, seeing that he's taken it from you. Don't take it back. Oh, hallelujah. Last verse, and then I'll turn the service over to our pastor. Church, the pastor has to come back and sing those. 
Amen. On the shoulders of my king is what I was talking about today. On the shoulders of my king. Now I want to tell you when I, when I was when I was little, we used to play a game. One of the games was is that that I would get on the shoulders of my brother, and then my other younger brother would get on the shoulders of my other brother, and and we have several others that would come down, and they'd all get on their shoulders. And the idea was to play king of the mountain, who could remain up and not fall down. And so they get on my sh shoulders, and he would get down, and he would lift me up on his shoulders, and I would get on his shoulders, and then we'd chase each other around, try to pull the other one down. But the one that had the strongest legs, whoever was below us, it always seemed that whoever was below us with the strongest, most secure feet, was the one that was going to win because when we grabbed the other person, they couldn't maintain their balance, they would fall over. Well, I thank God that my God is solid rock and that, that He doesn't change with the wind and He doesn't fall down and we can lift our hands to Him and He can pick us up and put us on His shoulders. I remember distinctly that when we went to Disney with the kids, we took the kids to Disney when my son was only about three years old. My daughter was like six and we took them and we went to Disney. And when I got to Disney, you know, in Disney they have these big parades. At, at, uh, they had, it was actually the 20, it was the, uh, it was the 50th year anniversary, I think it was, of Disney, I think, something like that, 50th years? I think they're, something like that, 50 or 70 years, I can't remember what it was. It was a big one. So they were having a big celebration at the end. So they were having a firework, but they were having a big marching down to the center. And I remember getting there, and when I got there, uh, I was there, I was watching, like, well, this is great. My son grabbed me and pulled on me, and, said, and he's like, Daddy, Daddy, I want to see, I want to see. And I was like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, he got all distracted. And he was down, and so I grabbed him, and, I, and, I, and he put his hands up to me, and I grabbed him, and I put him up to my shoulders. And now he could see the parade. Now he felt it was too low before. He couldn't see what was going on. He couldn't see that what was happening around him. He was, he was missing out on everything. And when he got up on my shoulder, he said, oh, now, Daddy, I see. And he would grab up on my hair because if he was a little nervous. And, or I'd try to hold his hands even when he we were walking. Sometimes he'd get tired. I remember at Disney, sometimes he'd think, I'm too tired, Daddy. And I'd lift up my shoulders and I'd hold him. And he'd have security. And he'd, have, he'd be able to gain his strength back again. All because he was on Daddy's shoulders. And I want to talk to you today about being on the shoulders of my king. Being on the shoulders of my king. It's so important that we remain there and we can be there, that we can have that protection and the peace. And I'm going to talk about three different things about that. But if you can, I look back actually to look at back in the like 2000, 2500 years ago, 2000 years, maybe 2000 years ago, uh, when they built the Christian tombs back then, after Jesus had resurrected and they built many of the tombs, inside the tombs, they would take and they would draw these drawings. And it was very interesting, I saw one of the pictures of it, it was a drawing, a very beautiful drawing from 2,000 years ago of Jesus with a lamb over his shoulders and with two lambs that are just kind of looking down, feeding, looking down toward the ground and two lambs looking up at Jesus, showing us that, that this is a person that, telling the person who ever looks at it, saying that when, oh, when we take our last breath, when it's over, that Jesus, people say, well, if he's just securing me and hold me, yes, but for them in their tomb, it meant that, oh, when I take my last breath, thank goodness Jesus puts me on his shoulders, calls me home, and takes me home to the Father, that I am no longer here in the ground, that I am with the Father in heavenly places, so that I know he takes me in his arms and brings me to heaven and I spend eternity with him, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We believe that we're not in the ground. And this is what this picture was about. But yet when you see the same picture that they have, they also put something else very interesting in that picture. If you look on the outskirts, smaller animals, you see wolves. You see other lions and wolves in the background they may draw, showing that even in the midst of that, the sheep that are lying on the ground, relaxing, not afraid of what's beyond them, what lurks in the darkness beyond them, because precious Lord, you are holding my hand, precious Lord, you are by my side, and I don't have to fear or worry. I don't have to worry what, what the world or what someone can do to me, because thank God my Jesus is stronger and better, and we can stand upon that rock, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what we stand upon on the shoulders of my king. Listen to Luke 15, verse 1. 
I'm going to read this for you. 15 verse 1 says this, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to Jesus, or him, Jesus, to hear him. They all drew, it says then, and I was like, well, what, what do you mean then? What happened that all of a sudden they're drawing near to Jesus to listen to him, these tax collectors and these others that were around, the crowd that was around sinners who were gathered around him. Why? Because of this last statement that he made in the, che in the previous chapter really hit home with them. See, there was someone else in that crowd. They were the Pharisees, probably the Pharisees and the scribes. They were there, and Jesus said something very distinctly to them, to the Pharisees and scribes, and to those gathered around so they could hear. He says in verse 34 of Luke 14, Salt is good. How many like salt on their food? I love salt on my food. I love to put it, it, it adds flavor to it. Sometimes when things, there's no salt, I just think so bland. Put a little salt in there. Wow, what an amazing thing. But Jesus uses that example and says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? And if, how shall you season anything with salt that has no flavor? It's useless. Put a bunch on it and you won't taste it. Put a bunch more and you won't taste it. You could coat it in white and you won't taste it because it has lost its flavor and it does nothing. It's useless, he's saying. Specifically speaking to the Pharisees at this moment, specifically speaking to the scribes that gathered around, that were there always trying to mock Jesus and other things, he's saying, he says, that they have lost their Savior. They look good. They look like salt. Mm -hmm. They thought you could put them on. They look real good. They, they spoke a good word, and they made themselves, and I'm the greatest in the kingdom. I'm great. I, I know all the Old Testament. I can quote all the scriptures to you. But their heart was far from God and wicked. And God knew it, and Jesus was constantly coming up against them because they only cared about the letter of the law and did not care about the love of God, and did not care about the love of God's people. So it goes on in verse 35, he says, It is neither fit for the land, not even the land wants it, or not even a dunghill. It's not even good for a dunghill, it says. It's no good for anything. But men throw it out. Men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. So all of a sudden, the perks up to these the sinners and the, and, and the tax collectors are like, oh my goodness. He basically, if they realize what he's saying, he's saying there are people that look really good here. That would be the Pharisees. And they are fit for the dunghill, he's almost saying. That, that, would, that would throw dirt right in their faces. They would be like, who is he? How dare he say this to us? And it goes on, we go, jump back to Luke chapter 15, verse 2, and listen to what happens. It says, And the Pharisees and the scribes complained. They began complaining, mumbling and groaning, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. What a horrific person that would welcome sinners, what the kingdom of God is all about, about welcoming the sinner in. Do you remember Jesus, the story about how Jesus puts out a, a parable about how a king wanted to throw a massive birthday party for his son, and he, or it was a wedding, or whatever it was, it was a wedding, and he was going to throw a massive wedding for his son. He invites every, all of his friends out, all the relatives, and he's waiting and waiting, and none of them show. Then none of them are there. So he says, you know what? Go out and get anyone off the street. Go get out of there. Bring them in. Welcome them in. And he's saying, at that point, he's talking about the Jews, how the Jews have rejected what God had done for them. And so now he was opening the door to the Gentiles, and now he's saying, all oh, welcome in. You all can come in now. And he opens the door for the sinners. And this is what Jesus was here for, to reach out to the lost, to reach out to those who did not know Jesus, to reach out to the entire world, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And he's reaching out to the whole world now, and making this offering open to everyone who will. Come, all that will, is what he says. Come all that will. So Jesus spoke, in verse 3, He spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, what man of you, I'm sure he's looking over at the Pharisees when he's talking, probably some of this, kind of glancing at them. What did he say? So he spoke this to them. Who? To the, to the Pharisees and the scribes he's talking to, because they had said this. What man of you, having hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine 
and go into the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. Which one of you does not go after that sheep? And what does he say? And when he found it, he lays it where? On his shoulders. Jesus was very specific about what he's talking about here. He didn't say he grabbed it in his arms and carried it back. He says he put it on his shoulders, this man. And when he comes home, he calls together all his friends, all his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice, be excited, be happy, have joy in your heart. Why? For I have found my sheep which was lost. That is you and me. We were the one that was lost and Jesus came and found us and redeemed us. We sit here today saved with eternity in our hearts because he has found the sheep, the one that's wandered off. And sometimes we still wander away. We even come to Jesus and sometimes we wander away sometimes. We kind of drift off and he comes hunting for us. He's, he says, oh, sinner, come back home. All those who strayed off in the distance, come back. And he searches out that one sheep. And he loves on that one sheep. He leaves the 99 securely and safely in the hands of others that are there in the pens waiting for his return while he goes and seeks out that one. Whether it's been hurt or wounded, he carries it back, he mends it, puts it back among the sheep, loves on it, and carries it on his shoulders. What a loving example of our Savior. He says, I say to you in verse 7, the scribes and Pharisees, that likewise... There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner. His points, I believe he looked around the sinners that were there in front of him. He looked, he looked at the tax collectors and the sinners. He, he says, as one of these sinners, just one, comes home, he says, there will be more joy. There will be likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just Pharisees. 99 just persons who need no repentance. He was being sarcastic at the very end of that. He was saying something about the Pharisees. He's talking about the Pharisees in front of him that think they're righteous. You 99 Pharisees who think you're righteous and don't need to repent of sin and think you're higher than everyone else, heaven rejoices more, not over you the way you are, but over this one sinner who comes home and gives his heart to Jesus. Yeah. What a glorious thing it was. There is, and I want to talk about three things. There is rest on the shoulder of my king. Oh, you may be weary today. You may be worn. You may be exhausted. You may feel like you can't take another step. But I want you to know that there is rest on the shoulders of my king. My son, when I put him on my shoulders and walked him through Disney, he got rest and was ready to jump back on. So I'm ready now to do it. I'm ready. I'm strengthened. I found strength in daddy. I walked on his shoulders. I stood on his shoulders. Or I remained on sat on his shoulders. And now I can come down and I have more strength. And that's what we have in Jesus. It says in Psalms 23, verse 1, we all know it. Sadly to say, it's mostly used at funerals. But it is not a funeral thing. It is a joyous thing that God is letting you know that the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. I shall not want. That is any day of the week. That is any day of the year. That is any month of the year. God is your shepherd. He is loving you and wants you to be on His shoulders to give you rest. And I'll tell you, when you come to Jesus, you get a rest that no one in the world understands. It is a soul rest. It is not necessarily a fleshly rest, but within, the soul can finally rest and put its hope in Jesus because Jesus is the answer for the world today. It's nothing else but Jesus. And He says, says I shall not want. I shall not want. He makes me what? He makes me. Thank goodness that I can follow my shepherd. And the shepherd makes the sheep. The sheep aren't too smart. He makes the sheep lie down. It says he makes them. He pushes them down says, you must rest now. Because you don't know enough to realize that you need spiritual rest. You need the word. You need prayer. You need to come close to the Savior and King, the Lord. This is a rest that he offers you. And I never really recognized where it said that before, where it says, where it said on that one verse, he makes, he makes. I never, I never saw that. Makes. Not, he yes. makes us. He forces us to go down because he says, you need rest. You don't understand. So, and I thank God for that because there are times I could rub myself ragged spiritually. And God says, you need 
some message. You need some message. You need, you need some word. You need some prayer time to strengthen yourself up and come down and get on your knees and be able to get down and say, Lord, I need this rest. Lord, I need to rest on my knees for a while. I need to rest in your arms. I need to rest on your shoulders. And this is what that sheep, he went and got that sheep. You know what happens to the sheep? They get out there and they get all turned around because they get lost and they get caught up in thistle bushes and, get, and they, they get exhausted and they can die, literally die from exhaustion. They can die from exhaustion, sheep can. That's how bad it is. And without the person coming and giving them rest and making them rest, they could easily be overwhelmed with the things that are around him. It says, he makes me to lie down. Where? In dirt? No, in green. Green pasture. I thank God, look over my field and my house down. It's all green. It's looking good now, but in the wintertime, it's all ugly. But the green grass does go on. The green grass is important to them. They feed on the green grass. They like to eat the green grass. But also green grass, look, at, I can, if I lie on my lawn now, it's soft. It's relaxing. I lie in the middle of the winter, it's hard, and it's brown, and it's dirty. And that's what God is saying, I put you down in green grass, you can be comfortable, and you can lie there and find peace and comfort. It says, He leads me beside the still waters. He leads me over beside those rivers. Why? Because you have to lead us there. Because sheep aren't smart. They'll step right out into the rushing water and be washed away. So He leads them before, to a pool what is calm and quiet and said, oh, you can go here. There are no crocodiles in here that to bite your head off and you drink in the water. He says, I washed over you. I made sure it's all clear. You can drink freely from this water. And Jesus does the same for us. He leads us to those waters where we can get sustaining life from the rivers of living water that we need in our lives to, to strengthen us and to help us and to give us peace. This is what Jesus brings into us. And it says, the, the verse 3, I'm going to end with this, this part. He, not end this message, end the rest part. He restores my soul. He restores. What does that mean? He brings it back to where it should be. He brings life into your soul again. He strengthens you. He brings a joy into your life. He brings happiness. He brings peace. He brings, he, you can find that all on the shoulders of our King. There's no other place to find it. There is refuge, right? There is rest, and then there is refuge on the shoulder of my king. I want to talk about a refuge. He is a refuge for you and me. He's a place we can run into, a place we can find peace. Scripture verse says um, in Psalms, it says, um, which is the verse that I've got in my refuge there, in Psalm 46, one, I didn't put it in my scriptures. Psalm 46, one says, God is what? God is our refuge. But not only refuge, He is our strength. So that our strength doesn't come from ourselves, it comes from God. Well, what is it? I go down and I work out every day in the gym and I pump iron. I thought that strength came from me. Yeah, it does. I'm talking about soul strength. Strength spiritually to maintain and to stand in the midst of trials and storms. This is my God who is my refuge. A very present help in time of trouble. A very present help. I love that. When? Present. This very moment. Right when you need Him. He is present right there with you by your side. You are not alone. The world will tell you uh, if you're all by yourself in this one. No, God is with you. God is by you. God, you know, everyone else may turn away, but you keep your relationship with Him and God will be by your side strengthening you, keeping you a present help not a future help, but a present help in trouble. Therefore, what? We will not fear. And I love that. Because with all that's going on, Pastor Jim was talking about all that's going on in the world, you can get a little antsy on what's going on in threats of nuclear war, problems with Russia, problems with China, problems with Jewish, the nation of Israel and the Palestine going back and forth and the war that's there. All that's going on in the colleges around our campuses, you know, and, and terrorism that is seeping into areas of our lives and around us, all this stuff that is happening can bring fear into your life. But God says, therefore, we will not fear. Why? Because we know that we do not fight alone. 
that we are not alone in this fight, that my God stands by my side, and he is my commander-in-chief, and he gives me strength in the midst of my storm, and he helps me overcome. I am not on my own. I am not alone. Psalm 91.1, a famous psalm that everyone loves to quote, 91.1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Are you dwelling there? See, some people want to walk into Jesus on Easter and walk out for the rest of the year. Mm. Or they want to walk in on Christmas and walk out on Jesus the rest of the year. But we are supposed to what? He who is the person who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He who dwells there, what? Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you want to be under God's shadow, you want to be on Jesus' shoulders, you want to be under God's shadow who protects you. It's just like an uh, eagle that protects this little young one's eagle that's in the middle of a storm. He puts his wings over them and the storm blows hard. They're on a the cliff. It's buffering hard against them. It could blow the little ones right out of the nest. But the eagle puts his arm and overshadows his young ones and protects them. And that is Jesus. That is Jesus watching over us. And he will say, the verse goes on and says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. Oh, that's him. Fortress. And I said, what is the greatest fortress ever, one of the greatest fortresses ever, that's around? And I began to look. And guess what I found? Well, good old great King Herod the Great built a place called Messiah. And it is overlooks the, the Dead Sea. And it is massive, massive cliffs, hundreds and hundreds of feet high. Can't get up it. He went and he built on top of this Masada. He built a place on top of a, a place he could go where he could have all kinds of food, all kinds of water. Cisterns were built up there. So natural rain would come off, uh, off the ocean, right? It would come off and it would rain and it would fill the cistern. They said you could stay up there. You could feed like 20, 30,000 people and have enough water for them for a couple years. And that was, was a massive thing. It was huge. You couldn't even imagine how big it was. And this is where it was a strong and mighty tower that Herod built so that, that he could run into. Right? That he could run into just in case the Jews overtook them in Rome. Just in case he had to flee for his life. He could run up on top of his facade and find safety and security there. This is our God's refuge. We can build upon Him. We can run to Him. He's a strong and mighty tower that we can run into, that you can trust Him, that He'll hold you tight and no matter what you're going through, and He'll never let you go. And it ends, I'm going to end it with this, not so the end, Psalm 91, 2 says, With my God, in Him will I trust. Oh, where are you putting your trust today? i got to ask you that today. Who are we trusting in? Who are we building our lives upon? Are we building upon the shifting sands of this world, or are we building upon the rock of Jesus Christ? If you're building upon shifting sands, Pastor Jim will tell you that in the city they don't build any building on sand. Do they? Nothing on sand. Nothing built on sand ever in the city. Always built with long drilled in ground, deep down in, pillars that go solidly built on concrete, built up so that the rest can hold the weight above it. And we build our lives upon Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground, all of the ground is sinking the sand. This is where we build it. This is where we build it. The last point I want to share on, there is rejoicing on the shoulders of my king. Uh, you know, I may not be happy at times, but there is rejoicing. And joy isn't based on all that's going on around you. It isn't based on how healthy you are. It isn't based on how much money you have. It isn't based on if you're in the street, living in the street. It isn't based on any of that. Joy is based on Jesus and Him in your life and not on circumstances around us. Listen, you know, you might ask, well then, but still, how is it really possible that I can rejoice in the midst of all my problems? Because you can rejoice through the problem. You can go through the problem with Jesus, and you can make it to the other side because God's got your back. Listen to Psalms 37, 23. 
the steps, it says, the steps of a good man or a woman are ordered by the Lord. I thank God that God orders my steps. And he delights in his way. Though he fall, oh, I mean, the Bible talks about Christians or believers, but those who follow God, the followers of God, falling. Though he fall down, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord will lift him up, or uphold him, lift him up, uphold, pull up and hold him with his hand. Oh, I thank God. Isn't that true that God will lift you up high and put you on his shoulder? That he will keep you up when you can't make it any longer. He will take care of us. You know what helps me rejoice in the Lord even when things are falling apart? You know what helps me rejoice in God? It's knowing that Jesus knows me better than anyone and knows what I need even before I ask. Even before I even mention it. I don't have to pray in Jesus. God knows it before I even mention it. It was already in his heart. I already knew what we need before we even asked. What a glorious thing it is. He cares about you and me. Jesus made it clear when he said in Matthew 6.25. Matthew 6.25 says this. Therefore I say to you, to you, to each one sitting here, to Pat, to Edwin, right? To each one sitting here. He says this. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. I've been watching some of them recently. For they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns. They don't do any of that. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than the bird. You think you're more valuable to God than the bird? I do. Hmm. I think you're much more valuable. He sent his son not to die for the bird. He sent his son to die for you and me. He sent us to die for all the sinners and the most lost in the world. He didn't. He sent his son to die for the Pharisees and the scribes, for those who think they were too righteous. He died for them also. He died for the murderer and the adulterer. He died for them all. So that we to have eternity. I end with this verse. It says in John 10, 14, Jesus tells you who he is. I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd watches over his sheep. He brings them to safety. He takes care of them. He makes sure they're not sick and he takes care of them when they need it. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And what? My sheep know me. See, if you don't know Jesus truly who he is, then then you're falling short of what God wants for you because he's a good shepherd and he says as you know him and as he knows you, you know him also because you study his word, you dig into the word, you seek his face. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down, Jesus said, I lay down my life for what? For the stupid, dumb sheep. All right? Because sheep aren't smart. There are no smart sheep out there. I'm sorry? But none of them go out and they, they don't, they're not like dogs. If you have a sheep as a pet, they're not like a dog. They don't come up and you can see them just sit and stand and jump and maybe even use the bathroom and go on the toilet. They have cats and dogs that use the toilets and flush them afterwards. I'm not going to teach a sheep that. Sheep are not smart. And God uses an illustration because sometimes... We are not too smart with what we do sometimes. Don't we make some pretty stupid mistakes sometimes and regret later on in life? I have. I'm not perfect. I do things wrong. Even, in, even as a Christian, I make mistakes that I regret later on. Yes. Don't we? Yes. But my God and loving Father says, Oh, come close. Let me just take you. I'm going to find you. I'm going to put you on my shoulders. I'm going to bring you back in because I love you and you are mine. Child, you are mine. On the shoulders of the King. Is that where you are today? Is that where you are? I hope so. I hope you're on the shoulders of the king. Because if you're not, you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place. So this morning, before the worship team leads us in one last song, and Pastor Jim closes out the service. You know, God's grace is for everyone. And God's grace is what? Amazing. It is amazing. It just, you can't explain it. It, it. it doesn't make any sense. There is, there's no other religion where the God dies for the people. Is there? 
And I don't think there's any other religion out there where the God actually comes down and dies for the people. Because they don't do that because that's not true religion. That's not, that's not, that's not what they're going to do. They're going to die. That's true religion, what Jesus did. He came and died. But they don't do that. They don't think that God needs to continue to live. So they don't believe that. So but our God came and he died and he rose again for you and me so that we could have something special. That Jesus says, it's there for you. My hands are open. It's a free gift. All you need to do is take it. But some people are Pharisees and scribes, and they think to them, no, I'm good enough. I don't need this Jesus. I can do it on my own. And sure enough, they will pay the price, which is separation from God. And it's not, you cannot get it. Jesus said it. He made it clear, right? You know the scripture says that there's no way to get to the Father, Jesus said, but through me, the Son. And to my work I did on the cross. And this is what he does. So all those who may be watching us out there, all those who are here this morning, I want you to know if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've missed an opportunity to be on the shoulders of the King. Because you can't be on the shoulders of the King without being part of his kingdom. And the only way to get part of his kingdom is by accepting him as Lord and Savior into your heart and life. So this morning, if every eye closed and every head bowed, if you do not know Jesus as this Lord and Savior, if you don't have a relationship with Him, not about religion, I'm not talking about religion, I'm not talking about any type of religion, I'm talking about a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus that came and died on the cross, shed His blood to forgive us of our sins. If you have, do not have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with Him, and you've never asked Him into your heart and life. This is your time. This is your season. And if you do not know Him with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you do not know Him, I just want you to lift your hands up to the Lord. As like we did before, remember what He said? We, we lifted, he lifted His hands up. Yeah. And my son lifted His hands up to me. Daddy, please take me. And Daddy will take you. If you lift your hands up to Him and say, Oh, Daddy, I want to be on your shoulders. I want to be with you in eternity. I want to spend time in heaven with you, Lord. Like the thief on the cross accepted you and lifted his hand up and said, Lord Jesus, I want to be with you and was with him, is with him in heaven at this very day. If that's you this morning and you want that, just lift your hands up and then I want you to put it right back down. And I want, I, want, I know Jesus saw your hand. Whoever you are that lifted your hand up to him, Jesus saw that hand. And now I want you to repeat after me if you want Jesus into your life. I want you to repeat this. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And I need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. And that Savior is Jesus. Who died on the cross. Who died on the cross. For my sins. For my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Wash me clean. And Lord, put me on your shoulders. And Lord, put me on your shoulders. I believe this morning. I believe this morning. And I receive you as Lord and Savior. And I receive you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And if you just did that, oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. He is right now. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I love the way that the pastor said that there were three sheep. I remember in the morning there were three sheep. Yeah. There were two that were on the ground looking up. And there was one who was on the shoulders of the master. Which one are you this morning? Are you watching and looking how Jesus 
is comforting, as we read. He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Are you observing the Lord comforting and helping someone else? Or are you partaking in yourself that Christ is ministering to you? I want to respond to Jesus. I want, to praise the Lord. I want Jesus to lift me up. Yes. And take me on his shoulders.
you know, he went to the writer of this who was a, you know, was a slave, he ran a slave ship. And one time he almost, almost, he almost died on the ship and there was a girl all died in Paris, but the storm was so great, he had never seen anything like it. And, and something came over his heart and he changed his life around and gave his heart to Jesus. But he says, notice he says, through many doors, dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. His grace hath brought me safe as far. So he's talking about the toils and snares not previously to his salvation. He's talking about all the toils and snares and problems he's faced since he accepted Jesus as Savior. But he tells you what gets him through. It's the grace of Jesus that brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me all the way up to home. And grace will will put me on the shoulders of my King and Lord. It's that grace that does it all. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. I want to make a couple of announcements before we break to those, have some fellowship and break some bread together. Uh, coming up, I just want to make this announcement with next door at Trackside, the building right next door to you right here, uh, where the youth meet, we have our services on Sunday. But I just want to promote this night that says join us for a life-changing event. Uh, we're going to have a couple of the teen challenge with young men who are coming out whose life they were addicted to drugs or addicted to alcohol and how Jesus has changed them and how they are free from the drugs and they are free from the alcohol and they're going to tell their personal stories of God's grace, deliverance, and hope of what he's done for them. And that's a day we're Worship team that's here right now, added to it to be a son who is playing also and a bass player. But we'll be there worshiping, leading in worship uh, that day. Um, we have a special singer, I believe, that day too, on the 19th. I think the plan is, right? We might be having someone special um, who may be leading the songs itself. We'll all be playing. The special guest singer will be coming that day, probably, I believe. And uh, Come out and just be blessed and to hear them, and then we'll have some fellowship afterwards. That's right next door. That'll be at 10 o'clock uh, next door. If you need, you say, well, I, I can't get down the hill. I don't my, my balance seems to do it. I will personally come up and pick you up, or one of us will pick you up and can bring you down. We'll have a car come up and get you and bring you down the hill. We'll walk you in. We're here for you if you need to. We'd love to have you come up to that special service. Uh, right those service there at 10 o'clock on Christmas Sunday, but... But that is a special one. We want to invite you out. We didn't want to leave you out on that. So praise the Lord. All right. Well, praise God, everyone. We're just going to pray real quick for the for the food. We're going to be packed next door to the fellowship. Lord, we thank you for this great time. We thank you that you are a loving God and that we can gather together. And you didn't just say, oh, forget about them. And I'll just let them pass away and let them be gone with them all. Because they're sinners and they don't care. But you sent your son because of a godly love. Uh, because you are love, God. You are, you do care for us. So, Lord, be with each one. Let your face shine upon each one that's here. Fill them with your presence. Guide them. Strengthen them. Strengthen their spirit, Lord, within. Let them know that you're there with them. We pray for the food that will be partaken of in a moment, Lord. Let it be blessed. And we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come here and just share the love of Jesus. We thank you for each one that's gathered here today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God bless. Praise God. Yes. Yeah. 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 The food is already served in plates. Did you hear me? Everyone, the food is already in plates already for you. So they should hand you a plate. I'm going to put the table out. The food is already back there on plates. That's where we're going to see them again, but we need their tears to the story. It's the 19th breakdown here. What they do is they bring...